of the Coordinating Council on Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, I am Julie Herr, the designated federal officer for this meeting, and the meeting is now officially called to order. Uh, for those who are in the room with us today, I just wanted you to be aware that we are webcasting this event. The webcast will be posted along with meeting notes, the presentation, and any comments that are received from the public on the Coordinating Council's website www.juvenilecouncil.gov within 90 days. Although the public portion of today's meeting is virtual, I wanted to let you all know that all written comments or questions will be answered at a later date. Questions may be submitted to me, Julie Herr, at julie.herr at usdoj.gov. This contact information is also provided on the Coordinating Council's website and in the Federal Register announcement for today's meeting. And with that, I'll go ahead and turn the meeting over to OJJDP Administrator Liz Ryan, who also serves as Vice Chair of the Coordinating Council. Good afternoon, everyone. I have the distinct honor of introducing Associate Attorney General Gupta, um, who will give welcoming remarks. I'm really thrilled that she can be here today to kick off the meeting. Um, she has a distinguished uh, record of leadership in the field of uh, criminal justice and justice writ large. And so we're just grateful for her leadership and all that she is doing to advance uh, justice reforms around the country. And I want to kick it over to um, her to give her opening remarks. So thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Liz. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and thank you to Administrator Ryan for uh, your introduction, but also for your longstanding commitment to uh, justice. Uh, for our young people in this country. You've got a long history there, and we're so delighted that you are now leading OJJDP for the Justice Department. Uh, and thank you to the Department of Labor for hosting us today. Um, I'm really pleased to be here today to welcome all of you on behalf of the Attorney General, who serves as the Chair of the Coordinating Council on Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. Um, I was here at this meeting last year and was honestly so incredibly inspired by the uh, young people in particular that we heard from at that meeting, but also from all of the work you all are doing across your agencies um, uh, for our young people. And I think this coordinating council is a really important body to advance that work. At the Justice Department, we recognize the significance of this council and the weight of its charge, which is overseeing the coordination of federal programs that serve our nation's youth preventing and responding to delinquency and creating opportunities that encourage young people to grow into responsible contributing citizens in healthy and safe communities. Um, and when I was at the meeting last year, we heard from a lot of young people who were talking to us about their own experiences and several of you were at that meeting, I know. Um, and it was last year in October, I guess, during Youth Justice Action Month. And I'm just glad to be here again with you today during Second Chance Month. Uh, and it feels particularly fitting for, for that reason. Um, the meeting here, I think, is especially significant given today's main topic, Second Chance Month and the services and resources that justice involved young people need when they leave incarceration and launch new lives in their communities. Uh, each of the agencies and organizations that are really represented around this table and in the coordinating council play a key role in providing the resources and that, that young people need and in ensuring that youth can actually take advantage of them during their reentry journey. As a prime example, the Labor Department's Reentry Employment Opportunities Program funds innovative, effective projects that help justice involved youth improve their workforce outcomes through apprenticeships, mentorship, uh, job placement, GED, preparation opportunities for restorative justice, programs to stem community violence, and so much more. And we all play a similarly vital role in offering real second chances to our young people who are transitioning out of the justice system and back into their communities. Um, I remember just some of the insights uh, that we had at the last meeting when there was a panel of, this young, of these young people that I told you that we heard from who are directly impacted by the justice system, either that they themselves were directly impacted or they had family members directly impacted. And they took time to share their experiences and make recommendations to us. Several of the panelists actually stressed that young people need resources before they enter the system and that we, when we are investing in our young people that is almost too late. Um, they spoke passionately about the impact of criminalization and incarceration on 
youth and families. They discussed how a lot of young people really struggle to find jobs and pay fines and fees because employers aren't interested in uh, hiring someone with a juvenile record. And the Justice Department will have more to say on that particular topic very soon, which I'm very excited about. The panelists also spoke eloquently about the problem of mental health needs that are yet unmet. We've all been reading all of the media stories about some of the really unique mental health challenges that our young people are facing. Uh, it's been a particularly hard time and we don't have the type of infrastructure that is adequate to meet uh, them uh, with these resources. And I know many of us are very hard at work on that. They also touched on the really heartbreaking topic of suicide and self-harm. And they discussed how suicide and self-harm or the harm, uh, kind of physical harming um, family members are engaged in is really touching their lives far too often. And one panelist told us that no one cares if you're okay, just that you look okay. And so we did hear, I think, importantly and poignantly from those young people during, at, at that meeting. Uh, and I hope that it, the work that we do really demonstrates that we do care if young people are okay. And we need to make sure that our policies and practices actually reflect that care very tangibly as well. So throughout the course of today's discussions, and I'm sorry that I can't stay, although I've asked for a detailed readout um, from this meeting, I really encourage you to just keep these important insights at the top of our minds as we do policy work. Sometimes it's easy to kind of dehumanize or forget that our policies and the work that we do is really aimed at lifting up humans who are often at their most vulnerable and young people certainly who are in need and leaving incarceration or become entangled with the justice system are as vulnerable as, as anyone can, can possibly imagine. We are continuously trying to improve the juvenile justice system to really ensure that people are afforded the best opportunities for success um, once they leave, but also uh, even if they haven't been in secure confinement, that they are able to seek out opportunities that can really set their lives on the right course. So um, thank you again for investing your time in today's important conversation and participating in the council. And I hope you all have a really great and productive meeting. So thank you. Thank you so much, um, Associate Attorney General Gupta for taking time to uh, share your remarks with us. We appreciate it very, very much. Um, so I'd like to now turn it over to Acting Assistant Secretary for Employment and Training, Brent Parton, and I want to thank him and his team for hosting us here today. Um, it's really wonderful to work with partners who um, are working with us uh, collectively. Uh, so thank you so much and uh, welcome. Sure, thank you. Uh, welcome to the Department of Labor. It's exciting to have you all here. I, my understanding this is the first time we've gathered outside of the Department of Justice. So. In, in a very bad kind of cool time. to be first. <laughs> <laughs> so excited to have you here. I probably was inside in one of those beautiful days in here. Uh, but I want to say a huge thank you and just echo to our team here at the Department of Labor. And they're sitting on the outside, but um, Kim Vitelli, Jim Kemp, Manny Lamar, and so many others in the Employment and Training Administration who have been a part of our contributions to this really critical work. Uh, and, and I will say, you know, to, to pick up on what the associate Attorney General said, ensuring that we're centering this work on the young people that, that it's about. Um, we, we have a broader workforce vision in the moment we're in that, that relates to how do we use the workforce investments we have to confront structural barriers to good jobs and opportunity and really equity at the center of what we do. We are deeply focused on how we structure cross-sector public-private partnerships that make a good workforce development work. We are deeply focused on the integration between workforce development and the care economy. And I think the Associate Attorney General bringing up issues around mental health coming out of the pandemic, how important that is to see that if you have a, a functioning, accessible care economy, it means that the rest of the economy can move, but it also means that people can take advantage of the opportunities to get access to services and training better, uh, you know, another chance in their life. And then the last piece is to always be thinking about where the ball's going, the future of work, knowing that how we work in the industry sectors in particular are always evolving. How are we creating people on to have a really strong foundational base to continue to adapt and evolve as the labor market, the economy evolves. These are big priorities across all of what we do at ETA. But when we think about particularly these young folks and when we think about youth in general, they're at the center of all of those pieces. And if you center a vision that has priorities for how you support partnerships, how you measure equity, 
how you think about integration of services. It, you have to always meet people where they're at. And, and in particular for us, we're committed to youth as a conversation around all of the services and programs that we finance. How are we actually building with them at the center? So that is why our, our agency just last year really initiated an effort, which, you know, we, we've been long advancing youth work within ETA, but to have a youth strategy called Youth Employment Works, which is first off working within ETA and across our discretionary grants and programs and policy to orient them around those shared principles, to orient them around the idea of there should be a no wrong door youth workforce system in this country that is looted us for so long that for me, which is so exciting about today is what the spirit of this council's about, given who's around this table, given the charge we have, which is how do we build the wiring of a system for young people, whether they're justice involved, whether they're at risk, to be able to access services no matter which door they come in first. And then to also make sure what they receive on the other side is able to deliver really core guarantees that we are know are critical for what it means to afford a young person to be successful in our labor market, to get the supports they need. We're deeply focused on the idea within our youth strategy around ensuring that we're getting real commitments and partnership with industry and labor partners and community-based organizations that can provide experiences, paid work experiences. For young people is another anchoring part of that vision. It's something that often goes underemphasized as a really hidden driver of inequity in our society based on who can have access. And I know you know deeply about this, Michael, who has access to the mentorship networks, the supports, the ability to see what they can be in these types of opportunities. Again, not what, depending on what door they walk in, but what are the types of experiences that we're working together to provide? In terms of what we want to do with that, I'll just continue to echo. We have obviously a significant funding that comes through our formula program through the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act. Those are decisions that are made in many respects at the local level, but where we have strategic investments, where we can provide policy guidance, where we can do that jointly as a federal family in many cases to make sure that those locals are getting the support they need to advance best practices and use those resources creatively. That's something I want us to be thinking about as a council, which is it's not just what we say you can use your money on or what the policy is asking you to use your money on, how can we engage together that workforce system and make the best of those formula resources that flow into every community? Um, and then we have our strategic investments, which I think is always an important thing to point out. And I just want to use one second to call out our growth opportunities grants or GO grants, which are a part of our broader reentry portfolio, but are focused exactly as the Associate Attorney General said, going upstream. And this idea that we can work and be serving with young people before they get into the criminal justice system that we can provide their supports if they if that is the case that they're there and building the evidence base and again Jen, Jen Kemp and Kim and the team that works on Go Grants have really done a lot in the reentry space to show us what works um, and then how do we use these discretionary investments? There's never enough money and never enough grants to go out there, but to scale the impact of them and understand what we're learning from these investments, what we're learning from partners on the ground is something that we can translate across broader practice within the system. So. Yes, money matters in all these cases, but I do think when we talk about these types of councils, what are the messages? What is the joint engagement? Where are there opportunities for cultivating and sharing best practices that's not just tied to one funding stream or another while we wait for more to come? But that, that could be the real power of what we can address. So as we think today about strategies, let's think about technical assistance. Let's think about how we leverage networks. Let's think about ways that we can jointly engage to advance these priorities, not just one grant program, one dollar at a time. Because the, the urgency is there, there'll never be enough resources. But if we work together, I think we can make real headway on those fronts. So with that, I want to thank you all for your time. I want to thank you all for your partnership. You have a strong partner here with an ETA. You have a host here at the Department of Labor anytime you want. And and really just excited to hear about the, the meeting and, and where we can go from there. Back to you, Liz. Thank you so much, Assistant Secretary Parton. Really, you underscored the importance of partnership. And that's really what uh, this council is about. So it's very exciting to hear you share that and then we're going to hear a little bit more about uh, some of the efforts here at Department of Labor. Um, so I also want to give a special thanks to Jennifer Kemp, uh, who leads the Division of Youth Services and the Labor Department's Employment and Training Administration. Uh, Jennifer and her staff were instrumental in helping to make this meeting happen and to host, host us all here today. Um, it, 
when members are willing to do that and to take this on, it truly reflects our shared commitment to young people. And we are really appreciative of all of our partners at the Department of Labor. So thank you so much. Um, I'd also like to extend a special welcome to our newest council member, Lourdes Rosado, who joins us from New York, where she serves as president and general counsel of Latino uh, Justice. Uh, I've had the pleasure of knowing Lourdes for many years. She is a champion for civil rights and an advocate who uses and challenges the law to pursue justice for everyone. Um, your insights and passion, Lourdes, will strengthen this council, and I'm so happy that you've joined us. Thank you so much. Yes, and lastly, I'd like to, um, before welcoming everyone on the council here and doing introductions, I want to welcome the young people who are joining us by video today from the National uh, Juvenile Justice Network and the Coalition for Juvenile Justice. These were some of the young people that we heard from in October and they're following the work of the council. Um, so to the young people who are uh, watching us today, um, you're the reason why we have a coordinating council and your expertise and insights matter um, and we're excited to uh, continue the work here. And as you um, all know, at the last meeting, we heard from these young people. And when young people with lived experience take the time to share their insights and their recommendations, it's really our responsibility uh, to listen to what they have to say. Their insights uh, help shape our agenda. Um, they identify issues that we can tackle um, and that our subcommittees are actually tackling right now. Um, so I'm excited uh, that we'll hear preliminary reports from both subcommittees today. Um, as you know, uh, and as uh, uh, Associate uh, Attorney General uh, Gupta said, this month is Second Chance Month, so it's really timely that we're here. Um, so for Second Chance Month, we're really focused on providing support to justice-involved young people, um, especially young people who've been incarcerated. And I'm really pleased to share that OGDDP provides Second Chance Act funding under two programs. Uh, we released a solicitation for Second Chance Act called Youth Reentry Programs, and this program provides comprehensive reentry services for moderate to high risk youth before, during, and after the release of young people from residential facilities. Uh, we also released the second solicitation for our Second Chance Act funding, which is addressing the needs of incarcerated parents and their minor children program. The goal of this program is to reduce recidivism among parents support responsible parenting, and foster positive development of all young people. Um, I hope you'll share the details of these funding opportunities to stakeholders who you might know who would qualify for these. So at OGDP, we have embraced a vision of opportunity for young people with community-based services and resources replacing confinement in detention centers and prisons as the default response to better need the needs of young people. Um, and to address the risk factors that young people face. Our community-based alternatives to youth incarceration initiative supports the closure and repurposing of youth detention and correctional facilities and the expansion of services based in the community in order to both advance community safety and improve outcomes for young people. And so I'm really thrilled to announce today that the council's next meeting uh, in September will take place in Houston uh, so that we can visit an innovative, uh, Judge Betancourt is here from Texas, so we're very excited to be in your uh, home state. Um, we're going to look at the Opportunity Center, and this is the first time, uh, to my knowledge, the council has actually had a meeting outside the Washington, D.C. metro area, so I'm very excited that we're going to see the Opportunity Center, which is housed in what once was a juvenile detention center. Uh, for uh, young people in the justice system in Harris County, Texas. And I recently visited uh, this center with uh, some of my colleagues at OGDDP, and um, they can attest that I have not stopped talking about it. I think I raise it every week uh, in the office. What, what's exciting about that project is that they're using blended funding streams. They have a long list of community-based services that are provided to young people, including educational services, financial literacy. I'm kind of looking at the each of you who, who uh, deals with these services for youth who are homeless, uh, services for uh, on mental health, uh, services for um, food assistance, and the list goes on. Um, the Harris County model exemplifies how young people and communities can benefit 
when disparate agencies actually come together with a focus on community-based services for young people. And so I'm obviously very excited about the center's work and uh, hope you will all, everyone on the council, you'll take the opportunity to join us so we can see this together and um, firsthand. So in a few minutes, we're gonna hear from the presenters who are gonna tell us a little bit more about their agencies, organizations, what they're doing on second chances for young people. Uh, Lisa Johnson, oh, there you are, okay. Lisa Johnson, who is the director of the National Institute for Working and Learning, will discuss the Department of Labor's Compass Rose Collaborative, which works with communities nationwide to improve education and employment outcomes for young people ages 18 to 24 who were involved in the justice system. And we're also going to hear from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, USDA, about programs that are helping to provide nutrition for low-income youth and to families that receive services in their home communities. The USDA's Child and Adult Care Food Program and Summer Food Program are in addition to the National School Lunch Program and the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, which is better known as SNAP. Um, OGJ's DP is preparing to send a letter to our stakeholders across the country with more information about the USDA programs that help ensure our youth and families get the nutrition they need each day. And this is especially important right now at the end of the federal COVID-19 public health emergency on May 11th, which means that many Americans will lose some benefits that they have received throughout the pandemic. So we wanna make sure that uh, justice involved young people are aware of the services that USDA can provide. So I'll close briefly by mentioning some of our activities during Second Chance Month. OGJDP is partnering with our sister agencies at the Bureau of Justice Assistance and also the National Institute of Justice and other federal agencies like many of you to highlight the significant needs of young people re-entering their communities and providing resources to help them succeed. So along with this council meeting, we're hosting webinars, youth-led podcasts, and panel discussions. We also offer a number of resources and funding opportunities that can be found on our website at odjdp.ojp.gov. And I hope that today's meeting will help identify even more opportunities for partnership around these important issues. And I really look forward to this discussion. So with that, um, we will do introductions and I will start to my left, uh, the CEO of AmeriCorps. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Michael Smith, uh, CEO of AmeriCorps, the Federal Agency for Volunteering and Service, which used to be called the Corporation for National and Community Service. Hi everyone, Shannon Herlow, and I am with USDA, National Institute of Food and Agriculture, and I am the director of the Division of Youth and 4-H. Hi, good afternoon, I'm Deborah Smith with the U.S. Department of Education, um, and I'm in our Office of Elementary and Secondary Education, and I work on formula grants uh, serving uh, what we call special populations. Good afternoon, I am Judge Renee Diaz-Bettingford. I am uh, part of the Coordinating Council, but I am also Hi, Cheryl Davis from San Francisco, practitioner member, um, and I work for Mayor London Breed. I manage the Human Rights Commission as well as her Youth Jobs Program and the Juvenile Justice Reform for San Francisco. Hello, I'm Kip Kim Peace, and I work for the Department of Defense. I work under military, community, and family policy in the Child Youth Advocacy. Good afternoon. My name is Adam Tierney. I'm a National Juvenile Coordinator with Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Ingvild Olson. I am the Director for the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment at SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Hi, I'm Beth Connolly, and I'm the Assistant Director for Public Health at the Office of National Drug Control Policy. Hey, everyone. I'm Sasha Sandberg Champion. I'm at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, where I'm Deputy General Counsel for Enforcement and Fair Housing. Aloha. I'm a practitioner from Hawaii, uh, Administrator of the Kawailoa Youth and Family Wellness Center in our juvenile system. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, as Liz mentioned, my name is Lourdes Rosado. I am President NGC of Latino Justice. We used to be the Puerto Rican Legal Defense and Education Fund, um, and we do a lot of work around uh, civil rights, including in criminal and juvenile justice. Hello, everyone. My name is Miranda Lynch-Smith. I'm at the Department of Health and Human Services. I'm the senior official for our 
Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation and also the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Human Services and Policy. Lots of title there. Um, we are the, the Secretary's main advisor on youth issues, children in poverty, um, behavioral health in the Great. So now we'll hear from Lisa Johnson. Uh, thank you so much, Lisa, for joining us today and uh, providing a uh, presentation. So we'll have a floor. Thank you, Vice Chair Ryan, and thank you, Assistant Secretary Harton and Jen Kemp, for the special invitation to be here with you all today. And as my slides are coming up, I will talk a little bit about what brings me here today. Thank you. And 23 years ago, when I was nine, I was here in this building, one floor down, when then assess, um, Secretary Alexis Herman announced the Youth Opportunity Movement and the Youth Opportunity Grants. And since that day, I have been addicted to doing right by youth and surrounding myself, others, around me like you that care about young people and that want to do the best that we can and to treat them the way that they should be treated and to be afforded the opportunities that many of us have had. Ray Bramucci at that time was assistant secretary and I won't forget his words. He, he pulled up a chair, there were a hundred of us and he said, if not you, who? And if not now, when? And those words have stuck with me. So I feel very reflective today and to be really honored to be here to speak on behalf of the young people. All right, and the slides are working, so that's even a bonus too. FHI 360, Family Health International, is a nonprofit organization located here in the district, as you can see, and we care. There are 4,000 of us around the world in 56 countries that care about humanity and locally led solutions. Here in the United States, we focus mainly in education, workforce, and health, and we serve as an intermediary for workforce and justice programs. Meet Debrina. She is one of our participants that has come a long way, and she helps us lead the way. My department, the National Institute for Work and Learning, our whole staff focuses on college and career readiness, workforce development, evaluation, and engaging young people in designing our services and programs. And we have our Compass Rose Collaborative, or our GO, GO grant through Department of Labor that you had mentioned, that serves young people that have been touched by the justice system to change their trajectory in a very positive way. As you were talking about earlier in some of the opening comments, which at the end, hope we can continue that discussion that you teed up for us, is that it is up to all of us. So we're pleased that federal agencies are caring about young people in this care economy. And we partner also with other, we partner with corporations and foundations that are also supporting young people. Some of the foundations are incubating new ideas and they're also sustaining some of the ideas that your dollars that have gone into systems, they are keeping that going post time with your funds. I'd like to spend the remaining time I have on the reentry model since it is second chance month and apprenticeships as a workforce strategy. And then we'll offer some considerations for, for you all in policy and practice. We started our official DOL affi affiliation in 2017 with Compass Rose. And I mentioned Compass Rose, it, and we named it that, and our young people named it that based on the compass that sailors use to find their way home, to find north. And this is for our young people to work with us to find their true north. We also thank Department of Justice, the Bureau of Justice Assistance. There's a lot of acronyms here in the federal government for, we have a PREP program, so post-release employment program that we are serving adults and young adults in, in North Carolina. 
So let's review some, some numbers. There's stories and there's numbers. And these numbers are really impactful. They're big. And throughout the presence of COVID, throughout some of the justice reform, a lot of people are returning to communities in our, in our cities from jails and from prisons. Big numbers, and they need big support. We need a safety net that are led by a cadre of professionals in the field that can help them and support them with economic success. While one part of their justice journey may be ending, the new part of the journey is just beginning, reentry, reintegrating back to their communities. Opportunity youth, especially those who are out of school and out of work, as you can see the numbers here, also need support and the need for the services is very high. If you take a look here, one of our participants, real life, uh, who is in our program in Baltimore, in an HVAC program, and for the young people that may be listening in, please make sure that you continue to share your voice with all of us and others, because we do listen, and as the comments said earlier today, this whole conversation was teed off in this council is is here for you. I'm back to my in the year 2000 for just a moment because I can't shake it. It really, really stuck with me. And I was a grant recipient at that time in Brockton, Massachusetts. The elements of that program, it was a saturation model that 36 communities across the country really built a system of support with the young people. During that five year initiative, 92,000 young people ages 14 to 21 went through that. Almost half, it was 48% were out of school or out of work at that time. And what the evaluation showed there is increases in educational attainment, increases in wages, increases in labor market participation, and Pell Grant increase and uptake. It showed that when adequate resources are given to a community, that good things happen and people's lives change. Compass Rose, this gives some elements that Vice Chair was talking about earlier today. It is oh, formalizing partnerships are necessary and just one entity doesn't do it. We work collectively and cohesively with many different partners, service providers and employers. And it's a human-centered design approach that we use, as well as this ecosystem that nobody can do it alone, and it does take an ecosystem to get there. Our providers offer clothing closets. They offer, they seek donations for food. They offer bus passes and, and the like, the essentials that people, people need. A few more numbers. In Compass Rose, our first, this is for our first two grantees, and we over overachieved, which is always the goal, is to make more than, than the goal set out. But what you can see here is, is the numbers speak for themselves. And when you look at something like a 2% reincarceration rate, it shows that your programs are working, and it shows that with that extra time and attention and supportive services, positive things happen, and then the negative things, it diminishes the possibility of returning to lockup, which is everybody's goal. Mm -hmm. We work in four different areas intentionally. We look for large urban, small urban, rural and tribal nations so that we are one country and we make sure that everybody across the country is served in this way. And we learn a lot. We learn a lot from the differences and we learn a lot from the similarities there. In infusing culture, and I think about our friend from Hawaii, we, we have a project yeah. there, there in Hawaii. On my campus. Yeah, so oh, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's really exciting to think about how young people take a look and an introspectiveness of themselves and that they're connected with others and they start by that sense of community. And that sense of community is also giving out, giving out to others and making it much more positive. And let's not forget data for decision making is something that we use, use as well. And 
we were really pleased and continue to be with Bureau of Indian Affairs and the Department of Interior and what they are focusing on with their young people and wraparound services <coughs> and the whole child models. We were able to work on an initiative that is called Tawahi, meaning family. And Tawahi was, was given out to different tribes that were able to create their own solutions for their own people. Why not best give to communities to figure out what the community need is? And we've created some issue briefs that are available and there are a lot of lessons learned there for our evaluation and our evaluation team that put together these issue briefs and documentation. We can share, share those as well. There are a lot of resources out there and all of, all of you are providing resources which the field does take and use. And we learn from the current resources and practices and we know that there is power in sharing and lifting youth voices, which is what we include in our reentry programs. Young Adult Leadership Council. This is really a bedrock component of the work that we do. So making sure that we hear from young people and the voices of them. It is made up from participants across the different geographies. And as an early takeaway that I had, it is essential to listen to the participants for feedback and to know how they are reacting to the program, where do we have to change, and what is going really well. Our motto is always the notion about nothing for us without us. Who am I or others to be telling what is best for an 18 year old? It's been a little while since I've been there and their voices really, really matter. So 20 years ago, the youth development practitioner became an actual occupation. It is a mouthful, it is a lot, but what we have done is at that time, DOL invested in staff. They invested in professional development for that whole cadre that I was talking about of the 36 communities. That there were thousands of people trained in practices and in how do you collect the data how do you document your successes to tell the story and how do you serve young people? So we, what we did is we took that and we registered an apprenticeship. So happy to say we have a registered apprenticeship which takes a little bit of time to go through and we're glad that, that we did it. And we're also here to help others get, get started in that vein. We wanna make sure that they have professionals have what they need and the tools to support young people. Opportunity youth, young adults that are coming back from prisons or jails, as well as after school providers and that out of school time so that people are busy and young people when they may be home alone or need something extra, they're being treated by a professional that is certified in these competencies. And through Compass Rose, we did work with our young people to make sure that the modules and the curriculum that we were doing are hitting, hitting what they need. And we have that to share with other, other programs or to all of you. It is built on, on youth voice. It is built on giving back. And as you can tell, we're a little bit of DOL groupies because we are an ambassador, one of the first cohort of the apprenticeship ambassadors, so we're giving voice. We suggest all of you do that as well. And this model is really dual purpose. It's for the young people themselves to have an opportunity to be that adult, that caring adult that served them when they came out. So if they're there, they're going through an education program, they're going through a workforce program, they're being trained, someone is guiding them along the way. And this becomes a career pathway for those young people themselves to both give back to others because they don't want to see other young people in their community taking a similar path or that off, off ramp, but making sure that it's somebody with lived experience who could really speak to this. And the career path, these are just some examples of the career pathways, the types of jobs that are available for the young people and it gives the near peer experience informing with their lived experience, either in the foster care system, the justice system, whatever system that that may be, 
And then you have a cadre of professionals, of young adults, to be infused in the field. What? And as we can see in Oregon, from the industry side, the industry benefit, this is a quote that we have collected from one of the supervisors that is has an apprentice. So you can see a little bit about what they're saying. And then on the flip side, one of our California apprentices words. So in the apprenticeship, you're learning and you're earning at the same time, mutual benefit. But the learnings from, from the field to, sh to share in these last few minutes is that we've talked about preparing young people, but we also prepare employers. And having employers ready to accept young people is just as important. Employers often haven't worked with young people. So workshops creating that, making sure they're able to receive interns, receive apprentices, to give both meaningful experiences to the young people, but also to be effective for their business needs. And as we look at this in thinking of the basic needs that we all have, these needs need to be met. And the effect on incarceration, you can see that it is off balance. And the models and approaches that we use consider these basic needs first and then along the way. And for those with trauma or additional barriers to employment, we start here and we build. And sometimes it is a circular system. And I'd like you to really take a minute to hear what is happening in the life of some of our young people. This, these are examples of the day in a life and back to Maslow and the needs that many people in our country have that so many of us might take for granted. They don't eat. They don't have a home. Right. So how can they learn and how can they earn unless we start there? And some ideas, policy, program, practice that all of you might be considering is housing. And our friends at HUD probably know that better than, than any of us. It is an unmet need for so many. And in our current economic times, it is even more pre prevalent. Here are a few of the policy and practice recommendations that come from the field around this particular topic. And we can dive in, hopefully, in our Q&A a little bit more on that. And I'm interested here to hear from the USDA next about food security. We see food security as an equity issue and a recommendation for our services. And allow food purchases to be part of some of the programs is just a simple fix to be able to feed young people in your programs. The field has a variety of services and supports and resources that are already out there. They, the, you do not have to reinvent the wheel. Caseworkers and counselors are using them and sharing them more broadly and give a structure and a space for youth. And through COVID, the hybrid approaches has, have really helped to offer more access in some cases to young people to be both in person and virtual. And I mentioned this a little bit, but as far as employing employers in this work and training professionals in the field, this is a critical piece to reentry and something that is pretty easy to do either self-paced online. There are many modules out there. There are modules that have been created. We talked a lot about mental health we, and there is healing practice and trauma-informed care. So some of what what we've all put together and we share is this approach and receiving somebody who has experienced trauma and what can that look like and how can we make those relationships stronger. And almost last, but the elements of a successful young adult program. As we know, they need a range of services. They have multiple needs, wellness, mental health, child care, access to safe places. The list goes on and on and on of the needs that they have. So as you put solicitations together, 
partnerships for the continuum of services, blending and braiding, as the assistant secretary mentioned, using the dollars smarter and having some, we have some ideas of how to possibly do that for the field to be sure that young people aren't having duplications of services and gaps in other services. And please know that one organization, again, can't do it on their own. It is that whole ecosystem. It is, it is all of us coming together around our young people. And as I end, I would like to thank you for your time and thank you for your commitment to second chances and also for first chances. There's a lot to be done and talked about for prevention and intervention so that that first chance becomes the only and there's never a need for a second. So thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. So um, I have invited Associate Administrator Kelly Blue, who runs our Youth Justice Systems and Innovation Division to join us at the table as a resource to the group. And so I wanna open it up to questions from the group for some questions, feedback, comments, discussion. Um, if anyone has any reaction they want to share? Just last week, one person that she just sent it on this information. And so we're collaborating and including it into the government work that are starting up in a couple of weeks. And so we think about this problem, the model, and of the uh, wow, the youth program. And so looking forward to seeing how it. First, I just wanted to thank you for saying first and second chances, because I think so often people focus on the second and don't realize not everyone has the first chance. Um, I had a few questions and I'll follow up offline, but um, I appreciate the piece around preparing um, employers yep. for work. And I, and I don't know if there's a standard or if there's at least some framework for that, but I think that that's one of the biggest challenges, not just for um, systems involve youth, but just in general, a lot of times employers are not ready and they kind of dismiss them as if they're not young people because they didn't have it all together. That's one. And then the second, just with regards to the learning and earning models, um, I'm looking a lot at the work that the research that's been done in Boston by um, Alicia Modestino. And so I think that that's another one that could be Use, but not sure if it's learn and earn in the sense that they get to go to college or that they get to go to school and they get paid while they do that. There, there are a lot out there. So for the first one, employers have been wonderful to work with, both small, locally, like locally owned small businesses and also some of the corporations that we work with, they are ready and willing to want to learn. And there are frameworks out there that we use and training out there that just brings you back to what was it like when you were 16 years old? Remember the hair? <laughs> so just thinking about what was that like and what are the approaches and how do you have to be open to learning and listening and making those connections, which both make, and we do items as far as remote internships or in-person internships, making sure that there is an agreement in place from both the employer side and the young so there are a lot of frameworks that we could definitely share with you on that to make it a, a real experience. And one of those is also following them even after they're, let's say, for example, in our situation, in our program is once they're off, once they're out of the system is even following them as they're, as they're going into adulthood and, and making sure that they're keeping up with skills yeah. and employment and so forth. And it's, it's that. Their care. Exactly. It's that connection because. Very, very exactly a lot of the systems end at age 18 or they end when you get a job so having that transitional person that can support around that holistic way has there's a lot of research and again frameworks out there we could share well could i just one more thing just to that point about following i i in san francisco we try to make sure that the employers think about being a letter of recommendation or building social capital so is that something that is embedded because we don't want it to be one and done because the resume mm -hmm. often they like they need to talk to references or recommendations yeah we've created a whole cadre of your social capital your social network something like 70 percent of the jobs you get because you know somebody your neighbor tells you your parents tell somebody in your social network 
does know somebody and those connections there. So there are, there are ways to show that and there's training for young people in that, which also builds their self-esteem, boosts their self-confidence. And it's a, it's a network like yourselves that people can come and feel comfortable in and to learn from. This is really fabulous. And uh, just a quick question, do you, what ages do you serve? And I'm wondering if depending on that age range, if you have to tweak your services or tweak the approaches, just kind of based on the various different ages as people's brains are developing kind of in that space. Yes. So yes, we have to tweak. That the core is similar, but our particular department does middle school through about age 30 and then over, you know, depending, depending on the need. Our company works in early, early child care as well, but I can't speak as much about that. But we do tweak, we do work and customize based on if it's a teacher, if it is a guidance counselor, if it's an employer, if it's a parent. So what is that environment? Is it hybrid? Is it virtual? Is it in person? So I'd say the core is there and adolescent brain development and the science and the science of improving lives is a lot of what it's based on and then where you are in that adolescent or lifespan. Sorry, I have one more question. On regard to the re-entry employment opportunities, as far as the program works, um, where do you, or where is it, or has studies been done to see whether, is it once they're released from these, for example, in the juvenile justice system, once they're released from these residential uh, facilities, is that, where the work starts or does it start while they're in the facility as they're preparing to transition into back into their homes? That works better. If, if we can go behind the walls, and a few of our programs are behind the walls so that they are connecting early and often and there's a soft handoff post-release. Because it's, it's, it's vital for um, those children to have some sense of confidence, right, when they get out because they're really going back to a home that may not have changed. The, the environment hasn't changed, the parenting skills. I see it every day and so they're more likely to reoffend right. and come back into the system. And some of the policies, as you know, if, if I'm an offender, I may not be able to go back and live with my family who might be on public assistance. I, exactly. I, can't, I can't live there. And so that is a consideration. And in Hartford, I give them a lot of credit we were working behind the wall until we started working behind the walls there, our partner there. They, when somebody was released, they dropped them off in the middle of a city that wasn't even near a bus line. So not, not helpful. So by, by our partners getting in there and working with them, just pointing something out so simple like that, they instantly changed that. And they, like, oh, that's easy. We can just drop them here. But they were also dropped to a helping hand with, our piece of the pie there. I'll ask Mark, since it sounds like one of the programs is on your campus, would you be willing to just talk a little bit about how this has played out from your perspective in your... Do we have time? <laughs> <laughs> so, I was kind of excited to see it up there. I was like, oh my God, this is... There you are. You, you know, in, in 2018, we passed a law in Hawaii as a result of our juvenile justice reform uh, successes that created the Kavailoa Youth and Family Wellness Center. It's literally a 500 acre facility that once housed 200 juvenile incarcerated. And we're, we're down to less than 20 now. But the, uh, the structures are now being utilized by nonprofits mm -hmm. for different types of populations. So we have, we have about 70 of those beds that are up and running right now. 30 are still at the correctional facility. We have a 20 bed homeless residential shelter for um, 18 to 24 year olds. We have a 10 bed residential program for victims of sex trafficking minors. And we have about another 10 bed for residential programs for vocational training for 18 to 24 year olds. So in, in terms of first chance and second chance, we have them from 14 years going through all the programs up into 25. Yeah, we're at the stage now where the second chance is we are literally pulling them out of the adult jails, the 18 to 24 year olds and say, hey judge, he was with us, can we have another chance? And we'll keep them on the campus. 
And so the judge will release them in the pretrial felons to stay with us. And, and, and in the five years that we've been doing this, none of them have ever run. You know, and, and they're getting their, con uh, and this is what, what I really want to talk about. It's important. Um, so everybody know their role in our, in our programs. Uh, and I was talking to Sasha here, you know, the housing vouchers are important. The HUD, all the transition that we have when we put these youth back into the community where they need help. Not do they only get the training and the alignment with the unions to get the best jobs they can offer, but also housing assistance in the beginning as they transition off the campus. We have the educational component there. A lot of them are not good in, in their high school, but they, they, when they work with their hands, the GED becomes more accessible to them. So that is prevalent on our campus too, the GED program. Um, we also find out a lot of them, their mental health uh, comes more uh, prevalent after 20, you know, in, in the more serious diagnosis. And so construction might not be the route for them or their autism. So we really partnering in vocational rehab, you know, to come in and help us determine what's a better con uh, vocational track for them. And they come in with their resources and help pay them while they're with us and, and give them jobs. I paroled a 17 year old last month and he had like $5,000 in his, because he's working uh, and getting money from the vocational rehab and the, and the training that he's, he's getting at the same time. Uh, but the mental health services are there as well to provide for um, them as they get um, diagnosed. So it's really a lot of wraparound services on campus that has been shown the success that we've had uh, in our system. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but I knew you would have a lot to say about that. Um, I know we want to take a couple more questions or comments from anyone in the group. On the apprenticeship program, say a little bit more about who the, the organizations are that partner with to sponsor it and provide kind of on the job experience. What's the potential or barriers for how we expand that? So I think the potential is huge. We're one year in now. And so workforce boards, workforce development boards, the staff of the workforce boards themselves, America's job centers, it is, a, it is an easy win for those that are already there to just infuse the system with the same competencies. So that is, that is one. We're kind of going one by one by one there in different regions. Nonprofit organizations that are funded through WIBS are reaching out to us and have had great conversations with Job Corps and a couple of the private vendors of Job Corps, but also your Job Corps yeah. staff too, being interested in that. And boys and girls, like the after school, it's out of school time providers. The, like through the Mott Foundation, there's 150 21st century learning centers. So really anybody that is serving young people. And, and my hope is that even wages over time go up, the more professionalized this, it's a large field. It's really hard work as we all know. So if the wages can, can be really high and people see themselves as part of a larger cohort instead of one or two in that particular city working with 50 or 60 young people. This is a way to expand it around the nation. Thank you so much. Well, please join me in thanking Lisa for her presentation. Thank you. Uh, so I want to, um, we're going to invite up a couple more um, speakers to share a little bit about what's happening um, with the USDA's Food and Nutrition Service. And I want to just kind of add some context to this in that one of the things I know many of you around the table see when you are visiting with young people who are justice involved or in the justice system is uh, the food, food issues, food insecurity issues. Um, I was recently at a, at a facility last week and we asked the young people what did they like most about the place and what did they dislike the most and they said they liked the staff the most and they hated the food the most. And so um, but, and I asked, well, what was it? What was the issue with the food? And they said, you know, not enough food. Mm. We're not getting enough snacks. You know, these are growing kids. Um, so 
I'm really excited to invite Nick Battles and Kenya Pennington from USDA's Food and Nutrition Service up to share um, what's happening there so we can learn a little bit about some of the efforts they're undertaking on these issues. Thank you. Well, well that gets out. I'm Kenny Pennington. Um, I'm a program analyst with the U.S. Department of Agriculture Food and Nutrition Service. This is Nick Battles. He is a Bill Emerson Hunger Fellow, National Hunger Fellow with us for a few weeks. And um, we focus on child the child nutrition programs and specifically the child and adult care food program and then the summer food service food program. Um, and we are so thankful to you all and the council for um, giving us the opportunity to speak with you all about programs we are so passionate about. And so um, we're excited about the potential opportunity to partner um, with you all to enhance food security among children and families in our communities nationwide. And we just wanna again, thank you for taking the time to join us. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Kenya, so much for the introduction. Again, I'm a Bill Emerson National Hunger Fellow with USDA FNS uh, until about the end of July. So I'm so thrilled to be here with you all today. Lisa, you hit the nail on the head when you brought up Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Uh, we're going to touch upon really just how vital uh, food is to folks, especially young people. Uh, so you can see here that things we'll be covering over the next 20 minutes, first and foremost being the Child and Adult Care Food Program followed by the Summer Food Service Program. Uh, we will then, before we close, provide a closer look at some of the changes, um, as Vice Chair Ryan alluded to, the coming two child nutrition programs, as well as the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP. Uh, we'll, of course, leave some time for questions as we all dive into discussion. So without further ado, I'll give an overview of the Child and Adult Care Food Program, otherwise known as CACFP, so you have a bit more context about the various populations it serves. All right, so what is the CACFP? Well, it's a federally funded state administered program. When I say state administered, that's typically the Department of Education or the D Department of Health in a state administering CACFP. Uh, they provide aid to those places that you list see, this see listed here, a variety of settings and child care centers, adult daycare homes, uh, emergency shelters, things of that nature. And it really provides uh, child uh, children with a very Important access to nutrition. Uh, close to 4.7 million children every single day receive meals and snacks through CACFP. That's in addition to about 140,000 adults uh, and non-residential adult daycare centers also receiving meals and snacks um, at those places. Of course, it's important to note that uh, these meals and snacks must meet USDA uh, nutrition standards to be reimbursable. And then the standards themselves do differ based on the age of the infants, children, or adults uh, participating in the care. Uh, so again, the, the benefit itself is the meal reimbursement meant to uh, offset the costs for program operators who are providing those nutritious meals to uh, children or adults. And I will mention also the three with the asterisks there are the ones that we think provide really some of the best opportunity uh, in terms of the population uh, we're discussing today to provide those nutritious meals to at-risk youth. So some key players before we dive into some of those uh, more specific settings. First and foremost, the, the states themselves, as I, as I mentioned. Uh, these are the three key players outside of the federal government. Uh, again, it's a federally funded, state-administered, locally operated program. Uh, and so the State Department of Education or the State Department of Health, they take upon themselves the responsibility for financial and administrative uh, duties. Uh, so they provide the monitoring, the training, the technical assistance to the institutions and the sponsors uh, that have more on the ground um, work. So speaking of which, those institutions are, have something pretty unique to CACFP, which is the sponsoring organizations or sponsors for short. Uh, and they also can take upon uh, themselves the administrative and financial responsibilities uh, when they have an agreement with the state CACFP agency. 
Uh, so they really are the go-to contact for sponsors and independent centers not operating under a sponsor. Um, the operational level under state agencies, of course, um, is the institutions and they get the, they get, they get the meals reimbursed to, to them when they have their facilities. So that last key player there are the child care facilities. They can be in a range of settings, as you saw in that last slide. Uh, whether public or private, they can apply to participate in CACFP. Uh, these child care facilities also are responsible for submitting accurate meal counts, of course, uh, maintaining food safety practices, and providing enrichment activities for participating children, which we'll get into now with a specific example of a setting in CACFP at-risk after-school care centers. These places, of course, have their primary purpose of providing a safe place to be with friends once the school day ends for children of, of various ages. Uh, the program only operates during the school year. Uh, however, they are able to serve reimbursable meals on weekends, on holidays, uh, as well as during other uh, school vacations. Some programs are sponsored by local governments, schools, camps, or even nonprofit organizations. They tend to be located then at the schools and community centers or at libraries. So in CACFP at risk, children that are 18 years of age and younger, as well as persons uh, with disabilities at any age, are eligible to receive those reimbursable meals and snacks. Uh, and like many of our other nutrition programs, CACFP at risk is for children in low income areas. So to determine whether or not an area is low income, we look at the attendance area of a school. And if 50% um, or more of the children in that area are qualifying for free or reduced price meals um, in school, then it's a low income area. And so we look at that national school lunch program data to determine that. Uh, lastly, as I uh, briefly mentioned a bit earlier, these centers must provide the educational and enrichment activities that we know are also crucial uh, in an organized, structured, and supervised environment. And there's no requirements for the type of activities they must provide, uh, but they tend to be, you know, life skills, um, organized fitness activities, uh, homework assistance, as well as like arts and crafts, depending on the age, of course. Uh, another setting that I want to touch upon is the Outside School Hours Care Centers, or OSHCCs. Uh, these operate uh, very similarly to at-risk after-school programs, but not within low-income areas. So this provides an opportunity for areas that are not classified as low income to also participate in CACFP. Um, and they also serve a slightly different group of el eligible children, those 12 years and under, or those children of migrant workers who are 15 years or under, and persons with disabilities, again, of any age. Uh, supervised and regularly scheduled enrichment activities um, are also offered at these OSHCCs. Uh, though they must be a bit distinct from extracurricular programs that are put on for, you know, athletic, cultural, or scholastic purposes. So a good example might be a boys and girls club um, providing after school and before school care for children. So I know that was quick, and I know it was a lot of information about CACFP, but hopefully it provides you some specifics about the types of populations that CACFP can serve, um, particularly for the audiences and groups that we're all focused on here today. So now let's talk about the Summer Food Service Program and see what it has to offer. Okay. So what is the Summer Food Service Program? And we refer to it as SFSP. And it is another federally funded state administered child nutrition program. And the purpose of SFSP is to ensure that kids have access to nutritious meals and snacks when school's not in session. So that includes summer vacation and when schools are temporarily closed for an emergency like a snowstorm. And I would say perhaps most, most importantly to families, meals served through SFSP are free of charge for participating children ages 18 and under. And sites must be located in an area where 50% of the student, students are eligible for free or reduced price school meals. And if that site is not in an area eligible location, program operators may issue household applications to the participating families to determine the income, um, income eligibility of participating children. And so program operators may also utilize census data to determine if the site is located in an eligible area. And it's primarily a congregate meal, meal program, which under normal circumstances, that means that children can enjoy eating their meals on site together. But before we end, we'll touch on a new non-congregate option that's coming this summer for rural areas. And so similar to CACFP, there are three major players uh, in SFSP outside of the federal government. And those are state agencies, sponsors, and sites. 
So state agencies are responsible for ensuring the federal administrative requirements of the program are being met, and they act as the go-to contact for our sponsors. And our sponsors are responsible for a wide range of functions, including supporting the administration of sites and reporting to the state agency. And sponsors serve as a vital link between the federal government and the state government, and then the actual meal service sites. So I would say that sponsors kind of act as like a business manager or like a project manager. And then our last key player are sites. And sites maintain the responsibility of actually serving the meals to children in a safe environment that's ideally located in a place that's easily accessible to children, like a park or a library. And a key factor to serving more children in need is by operating sites in locations where there's both a capacity and a need, which holds true for both urban and rural areas. And so a really, I find it very cool, but it's one of our more innovative methods of providing meal service and it's mobile feeding. And so the mobile meal model provides sponsors the option to literally bring the meals to children to better meet their community's needs. And so sponsors can deliver meals to an area using a route with a series of stops at approved sites in the community. And so in rural areas, children may live in isolated locations where access to meal service sites operated at schools or parks is a bit limited. But on the flip side, in urban areas, we there could be violence or traffic safety as examples of issues that may limit viable site locations. And so um, at USDA, we recognize that we cannot accomplish our mission alone. Um, and so CACFP at risk and SFSP both play important roles at different times of the year. And so between the two, we have the best chance to make sure that children receive nutritious meals year round. So organizations operating CACFP or SFSP benefit from having the ability to hire staff during the school year who are more likely to stay with the organization and remain well-trained. They can receive a steady flow of reimbursements that provides additional financial stability and recognition from, the, from families and their community as a stable source of nutrition services. And then in addition, states benefit from working with known program operators who are accustomed to federal program regulations. And so we don't limit our partnerships to just our program operators. We are aware of how essential it is to coordinate across federal agencies if we want to tackle childhood hunger and food insecurity. The partnerships listed here depict a non-exhaustive list of some of our recent, more recent collaborations. Um, for example, we currently have partnerships with HHS's administration for children and families and their office of Head Start. So USDA staff also participate in the Early Childhood Federal Partners Work Group. And this work group is a federal staff level collaboration of more than 70 representatives across multiple federal agencies and departments. And that, that partnership is focused on sharing resources and improving federally funded early childhood programs. So that is programs for children's, uh, children under the ages of five. And so we also have a partnership with Housing and Urban Development and their Office of Public and Indian Housing. And so program staff at USDA coordinate and participate in annual webinars with HUD to promote the connection between public housing authorities and the community meals programs. And so last summer, USDA and HHS announced a new policy to make it easier for families to enroll in Head Start um, by determining their eligibility simply by showing proof of SNAP eligibility. That means that families who receive benefits for food purchases through USDA SNAP will have an easier path to enrollment and Head Start's early education and child care programs. And so you might be wondering what you can do to get involved with us. And we recommend educating individuals who work in or participate on your programs to learn more about CACFP, SFSP, and our other child nutrition programs, including information about child nutrition programs when promoting grant programs would be an opportunity for partnership. Applicants could utilize CACFP or SFSP to assist with food costs rather than paying out of pocket. And as I mentioned on the previous slide, we frequently work on webinars, conference presentations, and participate on work groups with staff from other agencies as a way to gather information and raise awareness about issues impacting our communities. And so we've realized that federal programs tend to serve similar or overlapping populations. And so it's important to find the opportunities of overlap in policy as well. And so some federal programs we realize can work in tandem. So it's really about realizing when we can like play on the same team. <coughs> So Nick will be back up here to tell you about our resources. Thank you, Kenya. 
Uh, of course, we have a plethora of resources for you all to dive into at your leisure uh, when you so choose. Uh, first of which being the SFSP webpage. It's really the go-to location for uh, basic information about summer meals of all kinds. Um, so you'll see here, um, it's pretty easy to navigate to uh, more specific resources like participating in the Summer Food Service Program. Uh, the link is there as well. You can also use your favorite search engine, search Summer Food Service Program for the first result, typically. Uh, and the CACFP webpage, of course, also uh, easy to navigate. Um, they, we have guides, facts, resources for our program operators, but also just for general knowledge, uh, especially about those we talked about today, about the OSHCCs, outside school hours care centers, as well as after school um, at risk programs. And now, Kenya, we'll be right back um, talking about some updates to child nutrition programs uh, coming, whether it be due to new rulemaking or new authorizing legislation. There are some key updates we want you to be aware of. Um, so we'll, I'll be updating you guys about SNAP, and SNAP is another federal program housed in USDA. It's formerly known as food stamps, and SNAP provides nutrition benefits to low-income individuals and their families that are used to purchase use at stores to purchase food. And so SNAP benefits are issued on an electronic benefit transfer card or EBT card. Um, and so a variety of changes have occurred to SNAP over the last couple of years. Um, for one, the baseline benefits have increased after a reevaluation of the food plan or basket to determine, um, used to determine those benefits. And so SNAP benefits are adjusted every year in October due to the cost of living adjustment. But this change in 2021 was a bit more significant because on average, elevating benefits to provide an additional 40, 40 more cents per meal per person. And that adjustment happened at the same time as our emergency allotments were issued. And so EAs are, as they're referred to, um, were a pandemic era alteration that elevated benefits to by at least $95 per month for households during the um, heightened time of need. And the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2023 um, recently passed by Congress, ended emergency allotments after the February 2023 issuance. So this means that by March 2023, all SNAP households' um, benefits have returned to their normal pre-COVID amounts, aside from the slight permanent increase that resulted from the Thrifty Food Plan reevaluation. And then lastly, the nationwide public health emergency ends next month, and that will bring an end to several other waivers and provisions that made it easier to access SNAP and Medicaid. And so there is a helpful FAQ, which is linked here, about the current changes to SNAP. And so uh, USD has a variety of upcoming rules, proposed and final rules coming. And, but here are a couple I want to highlight. So first, there are two very exciting additions to our team's work. A new rule allowing non-congregate meal service in rural areas and the permanent authorization of the new Summer Electronic Benefits Transfer for Children Program, or Summer EBT. The non-congregate meal service option is for rural areas of the country where congregate meal service, and again, having kids eat together on site, may not be available. And so our goal with this option is to better meet the needs of children located in those hard to reach rural areas. And then Summer EBT is a new permanent program that will address food insecurity in the summer months through another EBT card for all eligible children. And so these two changes are a result of provisions included in the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2023, which was passed the end of last year. And then in the realm of school meals, there is the revisions to meal pattern rule. It's a rule that will enhance nutrition in school meals. And that proposed rule has received tens of thousands of comments from the public and um, is one of our administration's priorities. And as of, I want to say April 11th, 2023, there are 67,000 comments already. And then finally, Secretary Vilsack recently announced a proposed rule to expand what's known as the community eligibility provision. And so that will make it easier for more students and eligible schools to receive access to free meals. And that is all from us today. So I want to again express our gratitude for you all having us here. And we're going to go back to our federal partnership slides to hopefully jog some ideas about ways that we can all work together for this, for this mission. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd like to open it up again for questions, comments, Lourdes.
Yeah, I, I have a two-part question. Let's hear it. I promise. <laughs> um, outside of SNAP, um, are any of the programs or all the programs that you talked about available to residents in Puerto Rico and the territories? Yes. They are. All great. of them. That is really great because my second question is, because as you know, SNAP is not available to uh, people in the territories by act of Congress. Um, they have NAP, which has like lower maximum income eligibility and lower benefits, which means fewer families get less benefits mm -hmm. in the in Puerto Rico, for example, than they would here. And I was just curious if USDA or any federal agency has done any studies about how that disparity contributes to food insecurity in places like Puerto Rico. That's a really good question. I want to. If you want to get back, yeah, so I, like, I would get back to you. Say, um, this is obviously something that advocates, like my agency, are advocating for SNAP to be, uh, you know, to be provided to residents in the territory. So it would be interested in hearing and seeing, um, how, you know, if there's any research. Yeah, we'll definitely take that. Yeah, there, I, I believe there is some research, but we'll have to get back to you with additional information on that. But um, right. you're totally correct. the SNAP. It's different, right? It's not even, not at all. Thank you. This is my branch chief, Alice, by the way. Uh -huh. Thank you. She's here. <laughs> it is really, it's very um, helpful to hear that all these other programs are available in Puerto Rico and the other territories. I appreciate USDA stepping up and making sure that the programs are available where to, to hopefully fill in some of the gap that SNAP yeah. leaves there. Yeah, in terms, of some of, in terms of some of our outlying locations, like Hawaii, I will also just add, so the reimbursements in these programs are all steady, except that we actually do offer slightly higher reimbursements where the food costs are higher, like in Hawaii and Alaska. So we do try to take some of that into account. Great. Right? Other questions? Hey, thank you for the presentation. And great graphics, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, can you say more about how you think the end of the COVID uh, public health emergency is going to change demand and just what the trends on demand have looked like, both for folks tapping into assistance, but also for your nonprofit partners and your city partners on the ground uh, administering the program? I can speak about um, CSCP and um, summer is that during the during the pandemic or the heavier parts of the pandemic, our participation went almost doubled. So we went from, um, I want to say it was close to wow. 2.7 meals in 2019, million meals per summer. And then during that, during the pandemic, so fiscal year 20 and 21 and 22, it went up to just shy of 5 million. Mm -hmm. So the demand definitely increased, but I also think that our series of waivers and flexibilities that we provided helped make our programs easier to access. Um, and so I cannot speak to SNAP. I don't know if Alice, if you want to been there, but. I haven't worked on SNAP in a while, but I do know that um, one of the things that Kenya mentioned was those emergency allotments that we're giving all households that maximum SNAP monthly allotment benefit, as opposed to under normal rules where they would only be eligible for the amount in which their income falls and what other um, options their state has taken in terms of, because SNAP is also state administered. As some of you might know, some SNAP state agencies take different options like felony bans, for example, which I feel like might be relevant to this group, and that's not the case in every state. But um, so different states, there's different levels of participation, but um, I think that with the, the, the emergency allotments going away, folks are going to see a reduction. They probably are already noticing it right now if they haven't already, um, and so that is going to impact some of that. Um, Similarly, like Kenya was alluding to, we saw we, we saw a big increase in our community programs because we were offering free school meals for all, which mm -hmm. I don't know if y'all knew that, but also a lot of the other programs were also um, eligible. Folks who maybe not more normally eligible were getting them anyway. Yeah. Um, and so that is causing a big drop because it is in, typically an income eligible program. You do have to be eligible for your reduced price meals or live in an area where the majority of those people are eligible. So in that spirit or along that line, I think that the thing that I'm most concerned with is the changes after, right? Like the, the flexibility that was in place before. Um, and if some of those things are going to go away, for instance, the, um, the ability to just pick up meals and leave, that was a huge, huge impact on communities. I would also say um, the ability for programs to really kind of work with um, other organizations to like prepare the food and not be just only 
the city vendor that nobody was eating the food because it was so bad. Um, and I think those are the things that we're starting to worry about for the summer because we've seen um, folks not be able to get there just in time and the rules around like when you have to stop serving or how long the food can stay out or the ability to um, leave with things. I mean, I've seen where at some sites they're sewed by the, the letter that they're like, Sorry, the apples that are left have to be tossed. And I've seen kids like have to steal apples because they want to take them home. Like those are the things that are concerning or even just the structure in which people give them out. I've had people who were formerly incarcerated say, this feels like getting food at the pen. Like it's that kind of rigid um, process. Um, and then just thinking about HUD, like I've seen so many people who are like, that stuff is not like, we don't want that for the kids. They'd rather go to the food bank. Mm -hmm buy food and cook it in the communal <laughs> kitchen. So I, the question I had was like, can you do like SNAP or something for programs or for housing sites so they can just go buy the food and cook it themselves? Because I think that that culturally might be helpful in some places and the focus on nutritional sometimes doesn't translate to edible for folks, right? Like it might be good for you, but it's just not anything that I want to eat. So there's a lot there, but I, my main concern is the rules and regulations, which then basically um, mean that folks who are hungry and want to take an apple home can't because the rule says you have to eat it here and it's only for people of this age. I would say we definitely, um, that is definitely a concern we've heard. We just finished last week with a round of um, listening sessions and where we listened to parents who participated on our program, Pandemic EBT. And then we spoke to um, food bank operators from across the nation. And so um, I would say that there's definitely like a, it's a, I think it's a matter of like knowledge and getting out our programs because we still do, we will still have Pandemic EBT in place for this summer. And then starting next summer is when summer EBT for all eligible children will kind of like fill the gap as like a couple of us just said. Um, we do have a series of waivers that are available. Um, and as I mentioned, we have the non-congregate meal service option for the more rural, hard to reach areas that is gonna be in effect pretty soon. And so we have waivers for, for extreme heat, for potential crime. Um, we, we have the unanticipated school closure waivers that are in, they're available during the school year where you can serve summer meals, but um, I that covered. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And just to touch on the one thing you mentioned about um, not being able to take food off site, that is one of the things that's in our statute, unfortunately, that it is congregate meal service. And so that's why it is such a big deal for us that Congress just gave us the ability starting this summer to provide non congregate meals to rural areas because we haven't had that option before. And there is a value in congregate feeding, it provides a safe place for kids to go. In theory, it's hopefully a safe place for kids to go during the summer. but that's not always doable, especially in those hard to reach rural isolated areas. So we are hoping that we're going to reach more kids this year. I have a question or maybe just I don't know, maybe a lack of knowledge on my end. So, for example, detention centers, they get these uh, meals uh, through the school districts, which, again, our area is uh, one of those that are designated for low income. So mm -hmm. everyone gets free lunch. However, those are for the children that are in detention. How do we or how would we maneuver for those children that are not in detention but come to our courts or come to our uh, programs that we're establishing to divert these children from actually going into detention? And, and being that, you know, meals is a huge, huge uh, issue with children, even, you know, teenagers. I have three of them and they love to eat. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you know, um, and that usually comes out of our pocket or we work with nonprofits or so forth. How could we work to, to get maybe funding for, for that or, or have funding for, for example, those facilities that are already doing it or those that are detained? I would recommend um, for those specific facilities to contact their state agency. Uh, I think Texas Department of Agriculture runs um, runs it down there but because they can they could be sponsors and so they could be reimbursed for the meals served and I think that would help with like cost and then um, I would say it's really a matter of knowing who in your area provides the meals and promoting those like sites locally 
Um, and so we do require summer sponsors to promote their sites like via their site websites or Facebook or like just sending flyers home with students like before summer ends. That is a requirement of ours. Um, but that, that's, a, that's a really good question, to be honest. But I think it's a matter of like knowing who to talk to. And that's a bit why we're here. Yeah, and you might want to look and see if there's already existing sites in your area. Um, we have on our website a summer site finder. It's just in the process right now of being updated for this coming summer with new sites. But um, there is a map on there, so you can see what already is out there as well. <laughs> we have a texting program. Um, actually, the summer site finder, you can don't have the number on me right now, but there's a number on our site and you can just text it keywords like summer or verano in Spanish or um, meals near me and it will tell you the meal sites located near you. And then we also have a mapping tool on the summer site too to show you where meals are being provided and when they're being provided in the days of operation um, on our website. That'll go live May 4th uh, next month and it's something that's updated and refreshed uh, every week during the summer. Um, as as USDA approves those sites. We'll be sure to circulate that around. Um, I know we, this has really been a great conversation and thank you so much for joining us uh, to share what you're doing. I know we're gonna be sending out a letter um, across the youth justice field with information about these programs so that we can make that information available uh, because to your point, I, I don't know who actually accesses these in the youth justice space. So I think we, we look forward to really collaborating with you all at USDA on this particular effort. So thank you. Um, so I want to, we have a couple more things to do before we wrap up. Uh, I want to invite up, and, well, first let me just say, we're gonna uh, get two subcommittee reports. And I really want to just give such a huge shout out to our subcommittee chairs and everyone who has participated so far. This is, it's been a really long time since the council has actually had subcommittees. and. Um, I know everyone's been hard at work um, having conversations and moving things forward. Um, that's where a lot, of, a lot of our work is getting done through this council. So um, I'm inviting up Kelly Blue, who is uh, ODDDP's Associate Administrator and who runs the Youth Justice System and Innovation uh, sub, uh, Division and is one of the subcommittee chairs on program and practice. And I also want to give a shout out to Sonali uh, Nijawan from AmeriCorps, who was the other co-chair. Uh, I think Kelly's going to give the report, um, but I want to give a shout out to both of you two for your leadership in bringing everyone together and to everybody who has participated in that subcommittee. So, Kelly? Thank you, Liz. I'm pleased to be here today to report on behalf of the Subcommittee on Programs and Practices. Uh, this committee uh, has a total of 19 members representing 11 federal offices, as well as practitioners from the field. We've had the opportunity to meet twice prior to this meeting. Uh, we met uh, the end of March. At this first meeting, we focused on um, the recommendations that uh, emerged from the Young Justice Leaders uh, panel that you all had the opportunity to hear in October. And the themes or the topics that we uh, had the opportunity to discuss were related to mental health and substance use, mentoring, increasing and improving supportive services for youth returning to their communities from secure uh, confinement. Uh, there was some discussion around fines, fees, and addressing financial hardship as a barrier for youth. We discussed a bit um, around prevention and the school to prison pipeline and equity. Uh, during the discussion, um, I think all of us on the subcommittee agreed that um, it's important for us to identify opportunities to uh, create new partnerships and be innovative, but also to leverage existing partnerships. I think as a subcommittee, that's uh, our thinking right now. Um, we then had a second meeting in um, April, and at that meeting, uh, we focused on uh, partnerships that the subcommittee might leverage um, to help us move towards implementing some of the recommendations from that youth panel. Uh, we had the opportunity to hear from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Service, Services Office of Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation, otherwise known as ASPE, and so much easier to say. 
uh, ASPE provided us information about the establishment of a new Children's Interagency Coordinating Council uh, that will focus on looking at uh, child po poverty and improving child well being. Currently, ASPE is working to establish uh, that new council right now. In addition, um, ASPE uh, was there to prevent information to us about their interagency uh, uh, working group on youth programs uh, by providing us an overview of youth.gov, which I hope, I hope everybody, I hope that's your Bible. I hope that's everybody's Bible. Um, and also uh, receive some information about their Map My Community feature, which provides information on more than 10,000 federally funded programs from more than 100 federal agencies, financial systems. Uh, and I, I'm lifting that up because, um, and I, I didn't tell the subcommittee I was going to lift this up, so I hope you're all okay with that. Some of you are here. I'm lifting that up because um, I think that's a resource that um, uh, we, uh, we need to push out to our grant recipients, um, to our stakeholders, it might even be a resource that we're vested in looking at and, and figuring out other ways we can collaborate with that resource and, and even build it out. So that, that's my plug for Map My Community. Um, the, the most important thing that we talked about in the second meeting was uh, we want to really be mindful of um, in working with the Children's Interagency Coordinating Council and the Interagency Work Group on Youth Programs that we're not duplicating efforts, that we're finding ways to complement efforts. So that was a, another discussion point for us. Um, at the second subcommittee meeting, we also had the opportunity to begin to talk about what are some of the things that we could do to address the youth panel recommendations? What are some of the things that we could do to support our uh, agencies, programs, practices, and partnerships? And, and we came up with an idea uh, that's actually turned into a recommendation to the council for your consideration. Uh, what we discussed is uh, asking the council to serve as a co-sponsor of the OJJDP National Conference that will be held in Washington, D.C. in November of 2024. As co-sponsor, it would be anticipated that council partner agencies might consider hosting a session featuring multiple agency representatives to provide information about available federal resources and programs of interest to conference attendees. Other possible co-sponsor activities include planning a series of conference work workshops that are focused on the recommendations from the young justice leaders who presented at the October council meeting. And we would also uh, consider engaging uh, youth in those panel sessions as well. This is a precedent. There is a precedent for this activity by the council. Uh, for you, those of you who don't know this, uh, the council did serve as uh, a co-sponsor of a similar conference in 2006. Um, uh, just so you're aware, the, the conference would be funded and supported by OJJDP, so there would be no, um, no cost for uh, agencies to participate. So at this time, I'd like to uh, offer a recommendation to the council for consideration. The subcommittee recommends that the coordinating council serve as co-sponsor for the OJJDP National Conference in November, 2024. Thank you so much, Kelly, and thank you, Sonali, for um, co-chairing the subcommittee and, and doing all of that great work and conversation, it sounds like, really exciting opportunities. Um, before I ask for a vote of the council, does anyone have, anyone on the council have questions for the subcommittee about the proposal? Is it a one day conference, two day conference? scope of the conference? It will be multiple days, uh, two days, three days. I, I'm not sure that- Probably three. Probably three? <laughs> yeah. Just yeah. Just to go questions. <laughs> You know, like I think the, I think it's flexible in terms and, and yeah. you know, to be determined, like what what the council wants to do with that opportunity. Yeah. And I just I just want to kind of add, I, I, I noted that there's no cost, but I also want to add to this that because we're putting on a conference, there's lo logistical support 
so really it's you coming to the table with your ideas and recommendations for speakers or uh, helping us to figure figure out how to pull workshop, workshops together. But so logistically we would be, OGJP would be able to support. Any other questions? Okay, so we'll, we'll take a voice vote. So all in favor of the proposal say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Okay, the ayes have it, thank you. Um, all right, so next we'll hear from the Subcommittee on Policy, and I'd like to introduce Kristen Cracky, who is ODJDP's Associate Administrator for the Policy and Coordination, Policy Coordination Division, and uh, thank her for chairing that subcommittee. So, Kristen. It's nice to meet you. Thank you, uh, Administrator Ryan. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm happy to be here to address the Council today. Uh, the Policy uh, Subcommittee had the opportunity to convene once on April 5th. Uh, the committee currently includes a total of eight members representing five agency, federal agencies as well as practitioner members from the field. Uh, the purpose of the committee at this point is to identify and explore policy opportunities that would benefit from interagency coordination to more effectively serve our youth. Policy for the purposes of this subcommittee is being defined broadly to include legislative and regulatory actions, federal policy um, found in program instructions and guidances impacting practice. So the subcommittee began um, at the first meeting to identify areas of policy action currently under or already underway or planned over the coming year in each of the federal agencies. Um, and the committee members shared out some of those activities. It was good to hear today from the colleagues at USDA about some additional uh, regulatory uh, changes underway. Uh, we also reviewed and focused on topics discussed at the October meeting, that, um, particularly including the recommendations made by the youth. Uh, we had similar issues bubble up um, from our committee, as did um, Kelly in the practice committee, specifically to mental health access and Medicaid as one of the barriers for access. Um, we lifted that up in, in um, from a policy perspective, and there was some discussion about the need to possibly expand the membership of our subcommittee uh, to bring in the federal partners that work in this area. Um, however, the committee also discussed it was important to have some additional meetings and really identify some concrete strategies uh, before we, um, you know, expand into figuring out some of what our, our concrete strategies are before we go too much farther. Um, some other possible strategies that were explored at the meeting uh, include consideration of large-scale inter interagency demonstrations, which test both practice and policy strategies at the federal level to address barriers. We've done some similar work um, on, through the Coordinating Council in the past, and I think there was a general uh, appreciation in our committee about the importance of the two subcommittees really working uh, hand in glove in support of each other. Another strategy discussed was put, um, developing a potential uh, online resource, um, uh, online format um, that really compiles cross-agency federal authorizing legislation impacting youth to assist in our own coordination and awareness at the federal level. And then lastly, uh, there was um, so a proposal to consider uh, looking at just development of common language or a resource outlining cross-agency definitional differences used in federal youth programming and policy. And just to give some um, illustration of that, uh, congregate care, youth in out-of-home placement, community-based services sometimes includes out-of-home out of placement. Like, we use all of these words differently across our federal departments. Um, so the committee agreed that we would begin convening monthly to identify some more actionable strategies, and we hope to have some specific recommendations for you at the next meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, does anyone on the council have questions for Kristen? So my understanding is we need to approve the notes for both meetings, and they are in your packet. Um, so does anyone, uh, so we'll do a voice vote. Um, all in favor of approving the notes from both meetings, please say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. Okay, so the notes are approved. Um, so I just 
I know this comes to the conclusion of our meeting here. Um, I want to thank everybody for participating, for everyone on the council, for your partnership in this effort. Um, it's really a tremendous opportunity for us to collaborate. I know we heard some great stuff today from Department of Labor and uh, USDA and um, looking forward to more conversation. Before we close out, I will say we are going to share the PowerPoint presentation so everybody has that. We'll make sure we get the text number from USDA. Um, I also want to just um, recognize some of the folks who are also in the room joining the council today. Um, we have a team of people from OJJDP who are here. Um, we also have some federal partners from the Office of Violence Against Women and also the Consumer Financial Protection Board that are here too. So um, it's really exciting to see so much uh, participation by everyone. So I'm going to turn it back over to Julie Herr, who's uh, done tremendous work organizing this meeting uh, to close us out. So Julie. We are adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>